وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome to another episode of Fundamentals of Faith. In our previous episode, we had discussed the importance of uluhiyyah or singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. And we discussed some of the benefits and blessings of la ilaha illallah. But what does it mean to say la ilaha illallah? When you say la ilaha illallah, will you automatically accure all of these blessings? Will you automatically be able to enter Jannah just by verbalizing it? If you go to a non-Muslim and you ask him to repeat after you, La ilaha illallah, and he repeats after you, is that enough? Obviously not. So, La ilaha illallah has conditions. It has certain concepts that must come with it. And in today's lesson, we will inshallah discuss the conditions of this first kalima, La ilaha illallah, the conditions which make this kalima acceptable and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will be the talk for our episode of today. So I hope you'll stay tuned inshallah. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, we were discussing, or we were just about to start discussing, the conditions of the first shahada of La ilaha illallah. And obviously we understand that what is required of us is not just to verbalize La ilaha illallah. Because if, if that had been the case, then if a non-Muslim were to say La ilaha illallah without knowing what it meant, it would mean that he would get all of the blessings that we discussed previously. And that obviously doesn't make any sense. And the scholars of the past clearly understood this. One of the famous scholars by the name of Al-Hasan Al-Basri, he was the student of Abu Huraira. He died in the year 110. He was asked, didn't the Prophet wasallam say, whoever says La ilaha illallah will enter Jannah? So Al-Hasan Al-Basri replied, whoever says La ilaha illallah and fulfills the conditions and rights of La ilaha illallah, he will enter Jannah. So there are certain conditions, there are certain rights, obligations that are necessitated when you say this testimony. It is not just the verbalization. Likewise, another scholar by the name of Wahab ibn Munabbih, who also died in the same year of 110 Hijri, he was asked, doesn't everyone who say La ilaha illallah enter Jannah? He replied, yes, La ilaha illallah is the key to Jannah. But every key has ridges, it has holes, there's a certain shape to it. If you come to the door with the right key, then it will open. And if you come with the wrong key, it won't open. So yes, La ilaha illallah, is the key to Jannah. But each key has certain ridges, has certain characteristics. What he's trying to say is that when you say La ilaha illallah and you fulfill the rights of La ilaha illallah, then and only then will you be able to use this key in order to enter Jannah. The scholars of Islam have gone to the Quran and Sunnah trying to extract these conditions. What is required when you say La ilaha illallah? And they have found that the Quran and Sunnah clearly mention seven conditions for La ilaha illallah to be acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So today we're going to discuss these seven conditions in a little bit of detail and give evidences from the Qur'an and Sunnah. Because really our religion is based upon the Qur'an and Sunnah. There is nothing else that we need. The Qur'an and the Sunnah is the source of our religion. So we turn to the Qur'an and Sunnah and we try to find and discover the pr proper conditions, the proper key if you like, of opening Jannah, the proper key of La ilaha illallah. 
The first of these conditions, and there are seven as we said, the first of these conditions is the knowledge of La ilaha illallah. To know what it means. When you know that La ilaha illallah means that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the first condition. You know it. And that is why if you go to a non-Muslim or someone who doesn't understand the kalima, and you ask him to repeat after you like a parrot, that kalima is of no use to him. The testimony of faith is of no use to him because he doesn't have the first condition, which is knowledge. And the opposite of knowledge is ignorance. So the person, if he just repeats like a parrot, it's like he's an ignorant person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Muhammad verse 19, Surah Muhammad verse 19, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know, have the knowledge, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Likewise, the Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, and we quoted this hadith in our first, our second episode, whoever dies while he knows, huwa ya'lam, he knows, la ilaha illallah, he will enter paradise. So he must know what it means. He must understand the implications, the connotations of la ilaha illallah. And we discussed those connotations in previ- previous episodes. And the main one is that there is no deity that is worthy of worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second of the seven conditions is the condition of certainty, yaqeen. He must be certain. He must know for sure, la ilaha illallah. And the opposite of certainty is what? Doubt. To have doubts about it. Whoever has doubts about this has not fulfilled the conditions of la ilaha illallah and therefore he is not a Muslim. If a person has doubts, well maybe there is another object that is worthy of worship. Then he has not fulfilled this condition Therefore, his testimony is not acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of the evidence for this is Surah Al-Hujurat verse 15. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولَهِ The mu'minun, the, the people that have iman, are those who believe in Allah and His Messenger, ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا Then they don't have doubts in their heart. They don't have any doubts. They are firm, certain, yaqeen. In a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, I bear witness, La ilaha illallah, and I am Rasulullah, Anni Rasulullah. And then he said, No servant of Allah meets Allah. In other words, when he dies, he goes and he meets Allah, having these two state statements without having any doubt in them. He has no doubt regarding this fact, except that he will enter Jannah. So, of the conditions of La ilaha illallah, of the conditions of La ilaha illallah is that a person be certain beyond a shadow of a doubt. Not 99%, not 99.9999%, no, 100%. There is no object that is worthy of worship except for Allah. I will not worship, I cannot worship any object except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Certain about this phrase. And this is a necessary condition. Whoever doesn't have this condition has not fulfilled the basic requirements of La ilaha illallah. The third condition of La ilaha illallah is that he must accept it. He must accept this condition of La ilaha illallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly mentions this in Surah Safat verse 35 is that the reason that the mushrikun or the pagans or the jahili Arabs or the Quraysh or the Prophet sallallahu time they rejected the kalima was because of this. He says in Surah, Safa, in Surah Safat verse 35 that when the mushrikun of Mecca were told La ilaha illallah, they would become arrogant and reject it. Yastakbirun. Innahum kanu idha qila lahum la ilaha illallah, yastakbirun. When it was said to them, say la ilaha illallah, they would become arrogant. They would reject it. They would not accept it. So too is shaitan. Doesn't shaitan know la ilaha illallah? Doesn't he also have yaqeen in the sense that he knows that there is no object worthy of worship? But he has not accepted it. He has rejected the statement. He has rejected the statement of La ilaha illallah. Therefore, this arrogance is what has caused him to fall from the grace of Allah and be uh, restricted or, or be a portion to the fire of hell. There's also a beautiful hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. If you can hand me, akhi, volume 1 of Sahih al-Bukhari. Uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, as we said, is the source book of Islam after the Qur'an. And there have been over a hundred commentaries written about Sahih al-Bukhari. But the most famous one, and the one that shines above the rest, like the sun shines above the moon, and the moon shines above the stars, is the commentary by 
the Imam, the Hafiz, the scholar, the master, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, who died in the year 852 Hijri, he took over 30 years to compile this commentary of Sahih Bukhari. And he said that, I read this book cover to cover, more than 13 times. Every time I read it, I would discover something else interesting that I should have put in, so I would write it down. Until finally when I read it for the last time, I said, this is all I know, I can't do anything more. 30 years of his life. He spent to write this huge book of Fath al-Bari, every single hadith in Sahih Bukhari, he has explained it in a way such that we need no other explanation after this famous book of Fath al-Bari. Of the hadith in Fath al-Bari is a beautiful hadith in which the Prophet wasallam said, the example of what Allah has sent me with the guidance and knowledge that I have is like the example of rain which falls down upon a ground. A part of this ground was fertile, soft. So it accepted this water. It accepted it. It sucked it up if you like. And it then gave forth fruits of all types. This was one part of the ground. Another part of the ground was dry. But it was able to store the water. It was able to store the water. Therefore Allah subhanahu wa, or therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the people to benefit from this water. They used it for their crops and they used it to drink from. Yet a third portion of this land was flat and barren. Neither could it take up the water, neither could it suck it up, nor could it store it. It would just be washed away. And this is the example of the one, this is the process I'm saying, this is the example of the one who studied the religion of Allah and benefited other people versus the one who didn't care about it at all. The one who didn't care about it at all. This is a very beautiful hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ categorizes mankind into three categories. The first category is the one who was able to take the knowledge of the Qur'an and Sunnah, the rain, suck it up, and then give out fruits, give out uh, vegetables, give out crop. People could benefit from this. This is like the scholar who learns the Qur'an and Sunnah, who studies theology, fiqh, aqidah, sharia, everything, and then he teaches the people. There is another category of people, they are not to that level. They are able to memorize, but they are not able to understand. So they are like the pond. They store the water and they pass it on to other people. But they themselves cannot benefit like the first category. And this is the case with many, many Muslims, is that they will never become scholars, but they had memorized some ayat, some verses of the Qur'an, some hadith of the Prophet wasallam, so they can teach it to other people. So they pass on the knowledge, and they do some good to the Muslim Ummah, but not the level of the first category. And the third category of people is the category who didn't care at all about the guidance that the Prophet ﷺ was sent with. Neither did they study, nor did they learn, nor did they teach. So this shows you then that whoever doesn't care, whoever turns away, whoever rejects the guidance of Allah, including the Tawheed, then this person is the one who has rejected the servitude, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will face the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll take a short break and we'll continue the next conditions after we come back. See you soon. As for the Medina, which is the city of the Prophet, I want to go there and see the masjid that the Prophet built. I also want to see the tomb, the grave for Prophet Muhammad. Imagine the daunting task of preparing 100 young Muslims to cross three continents. And people living from where? No, no, no. I can't tell you. Not very angry. To gather in prayer, like Muslims all over the world, the group faced towards the Kaaba, the holiest of Islamic sites. Islam is not a race, or a culture, or a country. Each member of the group has a different heritage.
Okay, we were continuing about the seven conditions of La ilaha illallah, and we're now on the fourth condition. The fourth condition is that we have to submit ourselves to La ilaha illallah. Submit ourselves completely, our heart and soul. And the opposite of submission is to leave it, to reject it, to not act upon it. In other words, it's not just theoretical. That's the point here. The whole, what is the point of this condition? It's not just something you know, you acknowledge. It is something you act upon it. You live it. You breathe it. This is the meaning of La ilaha illallah. It's not just you know it in your heart. It's that your whole body and soul screams out that I am not going to do anything. I'm not going to move except for the sake of Allah. I'm not going to stop except for the sake of Allah. I eat and I drink. I live and I die for the sake of Allah. This is the meaning of this condition. Submission. The very meaning of Islam. What does Islam mean? What does Islam mean? Islam means submission. And this is the point. Of the primary conditions of La ilaha illallah is you submit to this statement. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Zumar verse 54, وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ Turn to your lords. Submit yourselves to Him. وَأَسْلِمُوا لَهُ Submit yourselves in heart, body and soul. The submission is in heart and the body and in the soul. Every single action that you do is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, None of you truly believes until his desires follow that which I have come with. Your desires, what do you desire? If you desire something, it has to be in accordance with what Allah says. So it's not just theoretical. This is the point. It must be put into action. Of what use is theory in and of itself? Even shaitan knows Allah exists. Even shaitan knows Allah is worthy of worship. But because of arrogance, he refuses to worship Him. But the Muslim, he knows it and he acts upon it. The action must be there. Or else the knowledge is of no use. So this submission tells you that I must believe in it. I must be certain about it. I must accept it. And then I must act upon it. It's not just talking the talk. It's actually doing the walk as they say. You have to really come out and act upon La ilaha illallah. This is the fourth of the seven conditions. The fifth of these conditions is that you have to be truthful. You must be honest to this kalima. La ilaha illallah. The opposite of being truthful is lying, deceit. In other words, you say it but not for the sake of Allah. This is being deceitful about it. And this is the characteristic of who? The hypocrites, the munafiqun. They say la ilaha illallah. Outwardly they pray, they fast, they go for hajj, they do the arkan. But inwardly, they are not sincere. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 8, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there are those amongst mankind who say, la, who say that we believe in Allah on the Day of Judgment, but they are not really believers. They say we believe. وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ They are not really believers. يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ They try to deceive Allah. يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا They try to deceive Allah and those who believe. وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ But they only deceive themselves while they do not know it. They deceive themselves because they think they're getting away with it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of all things. And on the day of judgment, these munafiqun, those who went against this condition, they are going to be in the lowest pits of the fire of hell. As Allah says in the Quran, that the munafiqun are in the darq al-asfal ibn al-nar, the lowest category of the fire of hell. Likewise, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a beautiful hadith in the same volume of uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, the hadith of Mu'adh, he said, Ya Mu'adh, there is not a single person who testifies La ilaha illallah wa Muhammadu Rasulullah sidqan min qalbihi, sincerely from his heart. There must be sincerity from his heart except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make hellfire prohibited for him. Here the Prophet ﷺ didn't just say whoever says La ilaha illallah. He says whoever said it sincerely from his heart. This is the point. You must have sincerity. You do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unlike the hypocrites who do the actions of the Muslims but in their hearts they do not really believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the fifth of the, seventh, uh, the seven conditions. The sixth one is similar to it and that is ikhlas. Ikhlas. And the opposite of ikhlas is what? Shirk, it's associating partners with Allah. In other words, when you do it, you don't do it to get praise of the people. 
You don't do it because, for example, you're living in a Muslim country and everyone else is Muslim and if you are not a Muslim then it's going to be a lot of problems for you. No, you do it for the sake of Allah and not for the sake of monetary gains or the problems of society or any other reason. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that أَلَا لِلَّهِ الدِّينُ الْخَالِسِ Know that the entire religion belongs only to Allah. Sincerely, khalis, ikhlas. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Bayyinah verse 5, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينِ They have not been commanded to do anything except to worship Allah sincerely, making the religion only for Him. In one hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was asked, Who has the most right to achieve your intercession? Who will be the lucky people to achieve your intercession? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa responded, the one who has the most right to achieve my intercession is the one who says, La ilaha illallah, sincerely from his heart. Sincerely, khalisan min qalbi. This is the one who will achieve the intercession of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May we and all of the Muslims be amongst those who achieve this intercession of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the sixth of the seven conditions. Is that you do it with ikhlas, with sincerity, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The seventh condition and the last of these conditions is that you do it having a love for this kalima. Having a love of Allah and a love of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. At the same time having a hatred for everything that is worshipped besides Allah and for the people that worship those besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you know La ilaha illallah, there is no object worthy of worship besides Allah. When Allah is your creator, He gives you everything you need. Then when you see someone worshipping other than his Rabb, you have to feel anger. How can you worship something that did not create you, nor can benefit you or harm you? How can you turn your devotion to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You have to love Tawheed and La ilaha illallah. At the same time, you have to hate all that is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is proven in many verses in the Qur'an, and we will discuss this in more detail in a future episode. But of the verses is Surah Al-Mujadala verse 22. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You will never find a group of people who believe in Allah and the last day, having love for those who oppose Allah and His Messenger. لا تجد قوما يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله. You will not find it, meaning that if you have true love of Allah subhanahu wa taala, you cannot love someone who doesn't love Allah. You cannot love someone who worships other than Allah. Let me give you an example that everyone will understand. Every one of us loves our parents dearly more than any other living person on the face of this earth. If someone shows enmity to your mother curses your mother, slanders your mother. Are you going to be best friends with him? You're going to go out to lunch with him and, 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 and pretend as if nothing is happening? It's not possible. Because going against your mother means going against you. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى To Allah is the greatest example. How much more so for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created you and He created your mother as well. He created everything you have. Now you find someone who opposes Allah, who fights Allah, who doesn't believe in Allah, and you're going to love him? It's not possible. And of course, we're going to get to later on the more details of this. It doesn't mean that you show enmity and hatred to his face, but it means that the true brotherliness of Islam, the ukhuwa, the brotherliness of Islam is based upon la ilaha illallah. Obviously, Allah commands us to be kind to the non-Muslims and to guide them to Islam. But my point is the heart, the heart, the love of the heart cannot be given to those who oppose Allah and His Messenger. Likewise, the Prophet wasallam said that there are three matters. Whoever has them will taste the sweetness of Iman. Three matters, whoever has them will taste the sweetness of Iman. Number one, that he loves Allah and His Messenger more than he loves anything else. This is the first of the three. That he loves Allah and His Messenger more than he loves anything else. This is a part of our tawheed and our, our beliefs, our Iman. Number two is that he loves his Muslim brother only for the sake of Allah. And this is also a part of this condition, that you love whom Allah loves and Allah loves the people upon Tawheed, the people upon La ilaha illallah. And number three, that he hates going back to disbelief, to kufr, just like he hates being thrown into the fire of hell. So these are the seven conditions of La ilaha illallah. Whoever perfects these conditions, whoever perfects these conditions will enter Jannah without any punishment. And whoever falls short in these conditions, 
then it is possible that if he only falls short and he doesn't neglect an entirety, it is possible that Allah might deprive him of Jannah for a time being, but eventually cause him to enter Jannah. And it is possible if he nullifies these conditions, then he will never taste the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the seven essential conditions of La ilaha illallah. Yes indeed, La ilaha illallah is the key to Jannah. But every key has ridges and every key has its lines. You have to have those ridges and lines, you have to have these conditions in order for your La ilaha illallah to be accepted as a key to enter Jannah. If there are any questions about these conditions, we'll take them now inshallah. Yes? Sheikh. Is it obligatory on a Muslim to be able to memorize these conditions and be able to list them? Okay, this is a good point here. The brother is asking, that, does every Muslim have to memorize condition number one, condition number two, condition number three? And obviously most Muslims haven't, haven't done this. The response is no, he doesn't have to memorize them in this fashion that we said, but he has to fulfill them. Sincerity, love, okay, knowledge. So he must fulfill these conditions even if he is not able to list them. This is the key. The key is the fact that he must have these seven conditions present in his heart when he believes in La ilaha illallah and not necessarily that he memorizes these conditions with their evidences. With this we come to the conclusion of our talk for today and inshallah in our next lesson we'll continue upon the same theme of uluhiyyah. We hope to see you next time. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.